Do you remember the moment when you realised something was wrong? I really recall when I realised that actually I can't believe this is right. There was this one particular young person. He'd been missing for four days, five days. We were chasing him all around the county and I had uh, you know, lots of resources looking for him. And then we brought him back to his, his, uh, his placement. And then when I found out, well, it wasn't regulated, and actually there, there was no form of regulation there, I just thought, this can't be right. And I had to check my facts and double check my facts to say, this cannot be right. You know, we are putting our most vulnerable children in places that actually aren't looking after them. This story is about the record number of teenagers who are living in care and about where the state, which has effectively become their parent, chooses to house them. It's also about a rapidly expanding part of the care system with few checks and large profits to be made and an assistant chief constable who's determined to change things. I do feel angry because policing can only do so much, but we all have a collective responsibility as a society to make sure that we're protecting our most vulnerable children. And I'm determined, if it's the last thing I do in my career, to make sure that we can work together to protect them better. Jackie Sabir is talking about the housing provision that sprung up for older children in the care of the state. The care system is complicated, but in simple terms, local councils have various options for children in their care. The majority live with foster families. Some are in children's homes, which are regulated by Ofsted. But from age 16, others can be put up by the council in what's called supported or semi-supported accommodation. This can be simply a house on a residential street with staff attached. Unlike children's homes, they're not regulated. The owners don't have to register their existence and they don't get routinely inspected. And this unregulated, unregistered part of the sector has mushroomed in size. Newsnight's seen figures which show that 10 years ago in England, just 2,900 children in care lived in this type of accommodation. Now it's more than 5,000. That's a 70% increase in a decade. You're looking about 800 to 1,000 pounds a week um, per child. So if you're, you know, it, it is a good way to make money. And if you're providing care and support, that's brilliant because we haven't got the capacity nationally. But if you're not, it's a good money-making way. Can you sum up how you perceive this kind of accommodation based on what you've been told about it? I wouldn't place my 16 or 17 year old in this accommodation. Why should we be placing other 16 and 17 year olds in this twilight world where at a very vulnerable age where they need the greatest level of support, we are abandoning them to paedophiles and organised crime gangs? It's strong stuff from an MP whose parliamentary group investigates missing children. But these grave concerns are backed up by evidence her team has gathered from police forces across England and Wales. They've given Newsnight exclusive access to their findings. The police are very concerned about the risk that they are being exposed to from organised crime and those who would exploit children. They're very concerned about the number of times that these children are going missing and they don't know what's, what's happened to them. And the picture overall is of a dumping children and leaving them to fend for themselves and take their chances with what can be a very brutal and exploitative world. 80% of the police forces that responded raise concerns about this accommodation. They share fears about homes that are cheap and poorly managed with little safeguarding, high numbers of children going missing from them repeatedly, vulnerable children housed with young offenders, and children put at risk of sexual and criminal exploitation. It's a picture familiar to many of the children we spoke to while researching this film. Many described feeling dumped in unsuitable homes with staff they believed weren't adequately trained. Some mentioned kids being lured into dangerous situations by criminals who deliberately targeted the homes. And other children we talked to described going missing time and time again. Like the teenager who told us she was moved more than 150 miles from a foster family where she'd been happy and settled into one of these homes in Bedfordshire a county she hadn't lived in for years. We're calling her Amy, now 19, with big plans for her future, 
she didn't want to be identified. I remember arriving quite late at night, being moved into the lower downstairs bedroom. It was just bare, even though it was a downstairs bedroom overlooking onto like the road. There was sort of no curtains and no privacy. And there was like a mattress, but there was no bed sheets. It was freezing cold. Um, I had to like use my coat and my blanket as a duvet and they were just try and make the most of trying to get some sleep. It just made me feel sort of desperate and sort of also very alone. This 16 plus accommodation isn't regulated because it isn't registered as providing care, even though the children in it often have the same complex needs as those living in children's homes which are regulated. I mean, the staff would just come into your room without even knocking. It wouldn't matter if you are getting changed or anything. You didn't know who was coming on at the night. They wouldn't share the rotor with us. So, And at times as well, there was new staff. So you'd just get up in the night and there'd be a random man in the house. They'd call you names. They'd threaten you. I've had a staff member threaten to slit my throat. And I think they were trying to build up a reputation for themselves. So we wouldn't, like, think we can, like, do what we want. And there was a time when I was like hit in the face by one of the staff members. Um, he was quite a large, like over six foot man. Um, and I'd gone to the police about it. And the police had come to the home um, a couple of days later. And the manager just wouldn't let me speak to the police. He spoke to the policeman on the, f um, on the phone, was like, oh, don't listen to her, she's just making it up. I'd turn up at social services in just tears because I couldn't live there anymore. I just said, just find me anywhere else. Literally, it doesn't matter if it's a slum in the middle of nowhere. Just move me. Amy says she ran off from her accommodation more than 50 times in her six month stay. Children go missing from these homes far too frequently, and that makes them a police matter. 17 year old lad at a care home, um, which looks after children from their age of 16 to 18. This lad has left earlier on, um, stating he was going to London to visit his girlfriend, um, whether that's the correct information or not. In Bedfordshire, we have probably around 60 children's homes. Around half of those will be some of these uh, unregulated settings but they are the ones where we have the majority of the children go missing from because the care is so inconsistent. Some are absolutely fantastic and we have a great relationship with them. Others, not so much. Do you go to a lot of properties like this through your jobs? Yes, we do. Um, the, I think the majority of the misplays we do go to are, are from um, residential care homes where children are on care orders, section 17, section 20s and things like that. It's, it's definitely the, the same names popping up on a regular basis. The teenager they're looking for has been housed in Bedfordshire by one of the London boroughs. New figures recently revealed by the government show these out of borough placements doubled between 2014 and 2018. Whether they're local or not, Bedfordshire police spend a lot of time searching for these kids they term frequent flyers. We will always prioritise dealing with missing children and the most vulnerable. So when we have five, six, seven children per night, which we can have, not turn up for their curfews and the homes will ring us, I'm diverting my resources, my, you know, my very limited resources that we have in Bedfordshire, clearly to look and go and find those children. But whilst they're doing that, you know, I can have 20, 30, 40 other 999 calls not being responded to as quickly as I would want them to because actually we're trying to find these children, whereas actually the duty of care sometimes sits with the homes and the placing authorities. Yeah, we used to take like massive risks. We wanted to escape. We'd get a train to London and think, yeah, let's meet some random on the side of the street because anywhere is better than this. We'd just get random men off the internet and then sometimes they'd come and pick us up from outside the home and um, they'd take us places. One man, he drove us to Scotland and stayed overnight with him in a motel. They were complete random and there's a lot of them just strange men who just wanted younger girls. And 
um, they were very, very dangerous. Were you at any point, or your friend at any point, threatened by them or hurt by them? or? Yeah, and a few times, like, some of them got quite violent when you wouldn't do what they wanted you to do. Uh, we always, we were quite lucky, we always managed to get out pretty unscathed. What did they want you to do? They wanted sex, and they wanted, like, drugs, and they'd, because they'd buy you alcohol, they'd think that thou, they, you owe them something. Amy was 17 at the time, and says she chose to go off with these men. She was fortunate not to be sexually assaulted. Others aren't. We're obviously all very aware of um, child sex exploitation, um, young girls and boys being taken advantage of, um, being victims and um, suspects of, of crimes, um, and as well with, with, with county lines and all of that. But again, we need the intelligence for that, and if, if people aren't telling us stuff, then we, we don't know. So like care homes like that, they don't really know a lot about the children that they're looking after. As for Amy, she says the way some staff in the home spoke to her was quite simply abusive. A staff member said, like, they'd seen people be murdered and that, um, oh, it wouldn't matter if anyone killed you, because no one would care. Yeah, they called us prostitutes and whores and that. Uh, um, they would just say, oh, just, yeah, we're just care kids, no one cares about us. Did you believe them? Um, a little bit, yeah. We're not naming Amy's care home, but they told us they investigate complaints thoroughly and operate with high standards. They added that they support this 16-plus sector being regulated. Amy was in the care of Bedford Borough. That council told Newsnight they're aware of the issues she detailed to us, which were fully investigated at the time. They said many other local authorities share their concerns about this unregulated sector. Some of Amy's story mirrors what police forces have told Anne Coffey. Cambridgeshire police said, These premises are often well known to local criminals and are seen as an easy target location for recruitment of new children. Hertfordshire police described children being effectively dumped in unsuitable accommodation. As a business, their focus can be misaligned to generating revenue as opposed to safeguarding children. We have seen examples where girls have been groomed and trafficked to other areas. Nottinghamshire Police described the 16-plus sector as not set up to deal with care, but trying to offer it and failing. West Yorkshire Police talked of Opportunities for potentially unscrupulous organisations to set up pop-up children's homes with little or no regulation, where the housing market is much cheaper, heightening the risk of the most vulnerable of children being exploited. We have had children placed from London into our own homes from opposing gangs and they have stabbed each other in the home. Well, anyone would have, could have told you that could have happened. So there's a real danger that actually we're putting these children in really dangerous situations and, and the local authorities are their corporate parents and actually we're putting them with people that we know they're in conflict with or that actually can recruit them, they can abuse them and I think there is something really fundamentally wrong with the situation as it is at the moment. This is a national issue and across the country in Norfolk we learnt from one young woman that even in better run homes life can be a far cry from the security of a foster family. Emily is 20 and still close to her grandmother. I was placed into foster care when I was 15, going on 16, and moved into supported accommodation as I was turning 17. And I found out with like seven days spare, and I had to kind of adjust to it very quickly, and I don't think I was ready for that move on. It was very overwhelming at first because I have only ever lived in a family, and obviously when I went into foster care, I was with a family and supported accommodation was completely different to what I was expecting it to be. On the first night, I walked into one of the rooms I was invited into and I saw a resident snorting drugs in front of me and it was my first time being exposed to that. They were, they were drinking in their rooms, they were doing drugs. It was very chaotic, but 
they managed, the residents managed to do it in a sneaky way so that the owners didn't really find out. And the people involved who owned the place were very lovely and I got on well with them. Emily's grandmother had originally offered to take in her granddaughter, but was refused. The family court involved in deciding Emily's future ordered she should stay in foster care until adulthood. Instead, aged 16, she found herself floundering, however hard the owners of her new home tried to meet her needs. I felt very alone for quite a while. I just felt like I was just dumped into this place and I didn't really know what to do when I was exposed to those things. We saw her going downhill with depression, anxiety, that all came on then, because she wasn't particularly like that before. Lack of confidence, not wanting to go out, it ended up with basically not wanting to go out without somebody with her all the time. I didn't even know what anxiety was at that point, so it was kind of scaring me that I couldn't do these things, because um, I didn't really have the support to tell me like what's going on, like why I'm feeling like this, so I just kind of had to live it. Do you think that an ordinary parent would think it would be a good idea to move a 16-year-old into a house full of other teenagers? Not at all. Not at all. Why not? Because there's a massive safety risk behind it. You don't know these people you're moving in with. You know, you're being exposed to drugs when you're not even 18 yet. Um, and it's just a massive, it's a massive shock, really. So what's the answer for teenagers who've often already had such difficult lives, they bring with them vulnerabilities that need specialist care and attention? It's clear many aren't getting it, and the pressure to regulate is mounting. I believe that the system can't afford not to make these changes. Yes, you will have costs at the beginning, but the costs of finding missing children, the costs of dealing with these children when they become even further victimised, having to have mental health support, and supporting their um, adult life going forward and them being in the criminal justice system actually costs much more than the regulation in the first place. If you're putting someone who's vulnerable in an even more vulnerable position, that's not doing what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be taking care of them. They're paying these companies thousands but not actually checking where the money's going. And I think Ofsted would be a very minor cost compared to the benefits that they would gain. Of course there is a profit to be made. It is a business, and it is a business that they know that they are going to get an endless supply of young people. If that is to work, it is absolutely essential that that market is regulated in a way that meets the needs of children. And so what is life like now for you in terms of all of that? Can you manage it better or...? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say I manage it a lot better now. I, um, I got involved with the YMCA and they helped me a lot. They helped change me, they helped me find better ways of living. Um, there's been cases where I've had like mental breakdowns and they've taken me to hospital and I would have never expected that before. And that was what felt like family, that felt like home. I finally got moved off to my social work after six months, agreed to um, a different placement. And that was where you went to a family? Yeah. I absolutely love it. Um, with my host and um, her teenage daughter and it's just it's just friendly it's warm it's kind and it just feels like home now and what happened to that boy that you mentioned at the beginning so unfortunately and it sounds inevitable but he was led into uh, a life of criminality. He is now running county lines. He will probably go to prison very shortly. Um, and he's recruited other young people into that lifestyle. He was the one that's driven me to speak out. And I, I look back and I think, what could we have done as the police? What could have our partners done? What could have all of us done to actually maybe prevent what has happened to him since? Was it inevitable? We all have got a responsibility to try and make a difference so other children don't follow the same pathway that he has. Well, that was Katie Razzle's film. She's with me now. Extraordinarily powerful testimony uh, from everyone, the, the police officer to Emily to Amy in that film. Where does this go? Well, I mean, I think it is important to say, first of all, that, of course, not all the children who go into this kind of accommodation have a bad experience. In fact, for many children, it can be a useful transition into independence. But clearly, in that film, you heard from people where it didn't work out, uh, the likes of Emily. Um, and she was in the care of Norfolk County Council. 
and they uh, have said to us that they disagree and that, that actually the care home she was in, the home she was in, was a good provider. And they gave us a statement and what they said was, uh, we strongly refute these claims. We've always acted in Emily's best interests, offered her advice, support and advocacy and investigated any concerns she's raised. And they told us we've invested £5 million in providing our own accommodation for young people, that's since, with dedicated round-the-clock support. So interesting that they are planning to do more in-house then. What's the government's view on that? Well, the Department for Education made clear that they too think this kind of accommodation can be useful. It can be used as a stepping stone for young people who are going to come out of care. And the Children and Families Minister, Nadeem Zahawi, also gave us a statement. Uh, he said local authorities are required to make sure that children in care are given suitable accommodation to meet their needs including that they're safe and secure, which is why I recently wrote to all directors of children's services to remind them of this obligation. But it's worth reiterating that we spoke to a lot of people, obviously, in research in that film, not just MPs, not the, just the police, but the likes of the Howard League for Penal Reform. I mean, they described this 16 plus sector as feeling a bit like a jungle at the moment. Uh, and they said they're concerned that children are being criminalised in this kind of accommodation and they want some form of regulation. Right. So if it, if it does feel like a jungle, why don't they just regulate it properly? Well, I mean, I've heard sort of very various reasons. Uh, one is the cost. One is uh, this slightly odd obstacle that sounds quite troubling, which is that in some of these homes, it's not just 16 and 17 year olds in care. It's also older, you know, young adults, 18, 19. So how would you regulate for children when there's adults in there? Um, but interestingly, the sort of body that's the front line of social workers, the British Association of Social Workers, they say regulate now, whereas the Association for the Directors of Children's Services, in other words, the people running children's services and the council, they don't agree, they don't want total regulation. They say that this kind of accommodation gives them flexibility, but they do point out that it works if it's planned and it's in the child's best interest, rather than if it just happens because there's a crisis and they can't find any other accommodation. But obviously there's lots to talk about and it's something that we're going to come back to in this series. So I just say that if anybody has had any contact with this sector, we'd just love to hear from you. Because there's more to come. Um, Katie, thanks very much indeed.